All right, good morning. My name is Bruce McMillan. I'm the general counsel of Owen Mitchell, and I'm also chairing the session today in part because I also chair the Brexit working group within Owen Mitchell. And I, like most of my colleagues who are going to be speaking today, I've been monitoring the Brexit situation since it first became a Conservative Party election manifesto commitment a few years back. Today is the first in a series of briefings which um, Mitchell is doing um, in the run up to the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. It's easy to lose sight in the current uh, very confused and busy times with the pandemic, the US election and so on, of the deadline that is now coming to us and also of the fact that this time it's for real, uh, given there have been a number of false starts before. Today's session is about an hour long and in this session we intend to answer a number of pre-submitted questions um, that have been submitted by the people who are on the call today and also to deal with any extra questions that are raised using the chat function on the webinar which has been monitored and we will feed those in at the end of the conversation today. In view of the width and nature of the topic, what we have sought to do is to provide a range of answers across a wide range of topics that are involved, but to do it at the high level with extra resources being available uh, from the people who are speaking and in other ways that I'll highlight later on today. So please, if your question isn't answered or isn't answered in depth today, do follow up with us because we will get back to everything that is raised for you and can, where appropriate, also offer a brief uh, Brexit uh, checklist assessment with you individually. I'm very pleased to say um, that despite all the other distractions at the moment, this is clearly in the front of mind for a lot of people and a lot of businesses, which is what it should be. We have 160 people signed up today. Uh, over half of whom are existing Owen Mitchell clients. So thank you very much for joining us and we hope that today's session will be helpful for you. And the remainder of whom, thank you, are people who have not uh, worked with us before. And the cross section of people illustrates the uh, range of concerns and the range of interests in the topic. We have um, people today who are registered from being undergraduate students through to chief executive officers from national companies to international uh, to companies based not in the UK and companies based here from a variety of different sectors from retail to pharmaceuticals and through to other sectors as well. This is uh, very welcome because I'm delighted to see that people are now focusing on the issues that we have to face and on the um, urgency of getting prepared. And a lot of the focus today is doing the best that you can to be as ready as you can be in the balance of the time that is available given the level of uncertainty. Um, I'm going to introduce our experts to you in a second and then point briefly to the resources that we have available for um, clients and also for anybody else who is not a client who's interested on the internet and elsewhere at present. We will then go into uh, a series of questions with our experts uh, using the pre-submitted questions that we've had from the people who are attending today. And I'd ask you in parallel to raise any extra questions that you have on the chat function and in the last 10 minutes of the conversation, we will seek to address any new points that have come up from that and also to uh, finally close out with some closing thoughts and priorities for you. So I'd now like please to introduce uh, our panel of expert speakers today. And I will start with Stuart Pajam, who is a partner in our commercial team. And um, Stuart has a very extensive range of experience across a national and international commercial work and transactions and is going to pick up on questions around supply, trade and tariffs today particularly, but any commercial points are within his scope. Secondly, we have Sibila Steiner, who is a partner in our employment team. Uh, she has a very extensive and wide ranging international practice and connections and has worked across uh, European environments for many years, both um, with Owen Mitchell and working actively with some of our international liaison firms who help us to uh, understand uh, and get appropriate understanding of issues from both sides, from the UK and from the other uh, jurisdiction. And then moving next to Craig Weston, who is a senior associate barrister in our regulatory practice and has also got strong financial services experience, which will be part of what he touches on today, because whether you are regulated by financial services regulators or are merely a user of services provided by those entities, which most of us are, um, there will be relevant things for you in the conversation today. 
And then, turning to the next uh, part of our panel, uh, we have Brian Bletso, who is a partner in our corporate division. And Brian is uh, also on our international steering group, um, who look at uh, how we and our clients need to interact with international change. And that's particularly important when you bear in mind that the uh, European Union reforms, or sorry, the exit from the European Union does not just affect our relationship with the EU, it also affects our relationship with the rest of the world as well, because an awful lot of the arrangements that we have in place internationally uh, are currently arranged through European Union frameworks and will need to be replaced as the recent uh, deal with Japan illustrated. And then we have Sarah Cardew. Uh, Sarah is a partner in our tax team and is a specialist in corporate and property tax and also in VAT and duties, which is one of the topics that she'll be covering today as it has come up on questions coming through. And Sarah is also um, a leading representative for us in the Law Society working groups on these topics in relation to Brexit. And then finally, the last speaker in our group today is Cheryl Palmer Hughes, who is a partner in our personal injury division. She specializes in complex cross-border personal injury cases and is the Owen Mitchell lead liaison uh, on Brexit matters with the Law Society. So that's our panel of speakers today, and we will be asking questions of all of them uh, to give you a taste and high level response on uh, the points that have been raised. As you can see on the slide deck, we have provided the email contact details for all of the people who are answering questions today in case you wish to fit, follow up and receive more details from them. In terms of resources that we have available to you, we also uh, have recently launched our Brexit Hub, and this is a very focused resource which is uh, giving you uh, more depth and more advice uh, about matters that are coming up on the exit end of the transition period and what to do afterwards across all of the topics that we talk about today and more generally. And it's important to recognise that things are moving very fast at the moment, so we're trying to keep this updated very currently and also to bring in relevant other materials. And one of the things that you'll find connected in there, which is a good illustration of the need to focus not just on EU relationships and rest of world relationships, is also a reference to some of the domestic changes that are coming through and are proposed as well as a consequence of leaving the EU. And a good illustration of that is a short video that we've posted from the BBC, which illustrates um, a discrepancy at the moment in proposals from England about uh, how to trade with Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales after the end of the transition period, uh, where it's proposed, for example, that uh, environmental standards in England may trump those imposed by Wales on products that are so manufactured in England and sold to Wales, so that something that's banned in Wales, in this case a coffee cup uh, uh, made of polystyrene, may still be forced into the Welsh market on the current proposal um, under the English proposal rules. So it's really important to focus across all of these areas. Now, as we get into the substance of the Q&A today, I'm going to ask an opening question of each of our speakers. And so turning first to Sibila, our employment specialist. Sibila, uh, for your areas of practice, could you ask, answer for me three related points? Firstly, what are the biggest points of uncertainty for um, people at the moment in your practice areas? And why are they important to focus on? And critically also, if we don't have an answer on them, these uncertain areas uh, soon, what's the latest date by which you need to start doing something to ensure that you have some form of response in place by the end of the year? So Sabina, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, um, obviously, the main issue in relation to workforce and to people in the context of Brexit is the fact that the EU freedom of movement um, will end at the end of this year, so at 11 p.m. on the 31st of December 2020. The EU immigration rules um, will be applying to all non-UK and non-Irish citizens, and the new rules will become on the 1st of December this year. However, until the 31st of December this year, with regard to EU nationals, the EU settlement scheme rules will apply. So the main issue um, is, and the main question that we are getting is, 
Um, how, what, what do the new rules say? Um, what do we need to do now to prepare for the new rules coming into force? Um, and how important is it to look ahead um, and to deal with these questions now? Sabila, thank you very much. And now turning to Stuart Bajam, uh, our commercial expert and talking on supply, supply trade and tariffs today. Stuart, could I ask you the same question, please? What are the biggest points of uncertainty that you have to focus on? And if we don't have an answer by what date, do you have to start doing other things? Well, I think from, from, from my perspective, there's just one big uncertainty, which is do we get a deal or not, which hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll find out um, without it. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges in terms of trading with Europe going forward. Um, but until we know the answer to whether we actually get a deal, what it looks like, or if we're not going to get one, it's difficult to say what the position will be. But I think at the moment, in view of the, the complications of not having one, then I think people just need to get on with preparing now and, and not wait any longer. Stuart, thank, thank you. And uh, you can see that Stuart's got an appropriate visual metaphor behind him of helping to guide people out of stormy waters to secure to secure a land as we can manage at the moment with it. And it's worth emphasising that WTO rules really only cover goods and even then only to a certain extent. There's not a lot of provision around services in it. And even the deal that's currently proposed or under discussion um, with the European Union does not really cover much on services. So the default assumption in many ways is WTO rules on all levels and as Michel Barnier is expected to tell the European Parliament today, no real progress has been made in the last two weeks of negotiations. So it looks likely that we will be uh, heading towards the lowest level, which is what Stuart's referring to. Thank you, Stuart. So Brian, as our expert on, on corporate and corporate structures with companies on the call who've got international um, agreements, international companies within their group environment or are trading internationally, what are the, the key things that you think should be focused on the key areas of uncertainty and uh, what should people do at the moment? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. I, th I think um, generally English corporate law won't really be impacted by Brexit, <clears throat> but there is one big issue, which is that the, uh, the form of English corporate structure uh, may not be recognised post Brexit if there isn't a deal. This is particularly relevant to um, group structures, for instance, if uh, an English entity has a branch overseas, um, that branch may not be recognised, um, which could cause all sorts of issues. I think um, it would be madness for this not to be sorted out, but I'm sure all of our experts are going to say the same. Um, I, I think action probably should be taken in the next few weeks if uh, there isn't some clarity around this particular issue. Ryan, thank you. And it's also worth emphasising that this is also an area, there's a lot of commonality on this particular point in the GDPR, the data protection space, because um, for companies that move personal data into or out of Europe, they will need to make arrangements to have a, an EU representative office to register and maintain their data presence in Europe after the end of the year. And the same also uh, would be true of European companies wanting to have data moving around, personal data in the UK after the end of the year. And that's that's addressing a question that's already been raised this morning by one of the people attending. Thank you. Um, so moving on to Sarah as our, our tax guru. Um, Sarah, uh, same question for you, please. Good morning. Um, for me, the main concern would be VAT. Um, unfortunately, it's very unlikely that the UK is going to get rid of VAT um, once Brexit is affected because it is one of their um, largest tax revenue generators. Um, and I would say to businesses um, out there, please get ready now. Um, deal, the hopes of a deal are receding um, and you need to check your contracts, review your contracts now because VAT rates will vary from country to country. Um, there could be a risk um, that you could actually lose money because there's a risk of irrecoverable VAT costs um, if you don't consider now who is going to clear and pay import VAT on goods coming into and out of the UK. Um, when will we know the answer? Well, if when a deal is ever negotiated, um, but hopes of that are receding and obviously with the current COVID crisis um, ever more unlikely. So therefore, I think you should act now 
um, assess all your contracts with overseas suppliers in the EU. And importantly, don't leave it um, until next year, till March 2021, to claim your VAT back. Um, and that's whether you're a French firm claiming UK VAT back or a UK company claiming EU VAT. Don't leave it to the last minute. Do it now. Thank you, Bruce. Sarah, thank you very much. And I think that message about you know preparing now um, and moving quickly, given how few working days there are left this year, is really critical across a lot of areas. As some of the government's own radio advertising, television advertising is now making clear, many of the processes involved uh, take 8, 12, 14 weeks, even if they're working properly, rather than being stretched. So, um, you know, for once, acting in haste probably will not result in repenting at leisure. Um, so turning to Craig, please, on the regulatory and financial services side, um, what, what are your insights about key worries and, and action timelines? Good morning. Thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, I'm in a fortunate position in that the FCA, um, as compared to other organisations and regulators, is ahead of the curve in its preparations for uh, the various scenarios that we could face and has been very forthright in its uh, publication and communication to those that it regulates. Um, for me, the, the key question is, if you are a firm that's regulated in the financial services sector, what are the rules that you are going to be expected to follow? And actually, we know the answer to that because the, the FCA has recently updated its FCA handbook. Um, by when? Uh, well, the answer to that is it, it depends whether you are a, a EEA firm, so a firm operating in the European Union coming into the UK, or whether you're a UK firm um, operating uh, in the UK and wanting to offer services into uh, other countries. Um, if you are uh, a, an EEA firm coming in, you have until the 30th of December of this year to make the most of the FCA's temporary permissions regime, which allows you to continue to uh, passport in your services under the old regime without having to get authorization. Um, but what we don't know is how long that regime is going to last. So. Uh, you must in, in any event be working towards seeking full authorization with the FCA. Um, and if you are a UK firm, um, the FCA has put in place a temporary transitional power which allows it to regulate firms under the old rules um, up until the 31st of March 2022, but with the expectation that firms are working towards um, uh, putting systems and controls in place to uh, meet the new FCA handbook rules by the end of the transition period, but with the caveat that no um, enforcement action will be taken by the FCA for breaches of those um, standards until 31st of March 2022. So the takeaway is you need to familiarise yourself with whether you need to access the temporary permission regime, and you also need to familiarise yourself with the new FCA handbook rules. Thank you, Craig. And it also goes without saying that if you're a user of the of companies that are regulated, you need to understand how they're responding to it because it may affect whether whether they can or the scope of their service provision to you. Indeed. So thank you. Um, and moving to Cheryl uh, Palmer Hughes, um, our complex personal injury uh, specialist, and with the withdraw withdrawal, I, I guess, of the European Health Insurance Card regime for for us from the end of the year. Um, in both directions. Uh, I guess there's a lot uh, of things to, to be focused on, Cheryl. What, what are the key uncertainties for you and what's the deadline for responding, please? Thank you, Bruce. Um, the biggest area of uncertainty, well, I can narrow it down to two really, until we know what the deal will look like or if there is a deal, um, there is uncertainty as to where we might be able to bring claims on behalf of injured people um, and how we might enforce judgments that we have for compensation. Um, we always look at where it might be best to bring claims for people who have been injured in a country that isn't their own. Um, often that is in England and Wales. Um, there are ways that we can bring it a claim in England and Wales now by virtue of European regulations. And there will be ways after Brexit um, that we can do that. But until we know what a deal looks like or if we have um, been included in certain conventions, then we don't know what regime will apply. Um, so what we can do now is we know where we stand now between now and the end of the year. Um, so for people who have been injured previously and haven't brought a claim yet, we know that we can bring the claim here um, and we can we can get that going forward, which is what we've done for our clients, um, because that is the only way that we can really control what's going on. Beyond that, we're going to have to be um, nimble and agile in terms of 
learning what regime will apply and make sure that we understand how we can best represent our clients. Thank you. And this again brings home, I think, the importance of proactively horizon scanning on uh, all areas that affect your business and, you, and your personal life um, with personal and work travel, but more generally um, in a fast changing environment. Um, uh, you know, the leaders of our businesses and the leaders of our uh, law functions in the businesses need to be very proactive and uh, horizon scanning and practically thinking about the different range of potential impacts so they can manage against those those risks or at least mitigate them the best we can. So thank you very much. Everybody. I'm now going to turn to some more specific questions that have come in. Um, and the first one, uh, turning back to Sibila, um, it's a question that's been raised by two um, uh, people um, on the call today. Uh, Gianluca and Gitali, um, and they both raised the same, essentially the same question, which is what are the consequences of Brexit on Europeans wanting to move and work in the UK and linked within that, uh, looking at the resident labour market test. So Sibylla, could you uh, please address that for us? Uh, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, I would briefly just, I would like to start um, by briefly um, referring to the current EU settlement scheme, um, which is, as I said earlier, uh, still ongoing. And under that scheme, it is possible for EU nationals who come and settle in this country by 11 o'clock at the end of this year to apply for pre-settled status. And then after they've been here for sufficiently long to apply for settled status. And that application can be made until the 30th of June 2021, so next year. For EU nationals who want to come to the UK to live and work here from the 1st of January next year onwards, the new immigration rules apply. And the two main options uh, that I briefly want to mention today is the skilled workers visa and the intra-company visa. The skilled workers visa is a visa that's replacing the current tier two visa. Um, and there is some good news um, in relation to the um, to the new immigration rules that will come into force. Um, the first one is that the resident labour market test will be abolished, so that will not apply anymore from the 1st of January 2021. Um, it's still required um, that there is a genuine vacancy, um, so the Home Office would be looking at um, whether this vacancy might just have been created for a particular person to come over um, and they will need to decide, as I said, whether it is genuine. Um, the other changes are that there will no longer be a cap on the skilled workers visa um, and there will also be no cooling off period when it comes to switching between different types of visa. The bad news, if we want to call it that, um, or the more difficult news for um, EU nationals is that they will now also be required um, to have a total number of 70 points um, in order to come to this country. Now, the 70 points, um, are there are certain requirements that are non-tradable points. So there has to be a job offer from an approved employer the role must be on the standard occupational list and the required skills level has to be A level or equivalent and the person has to be able to speak English. Those are the non-tradable requirements, those have to be fulfilled. Um, then there are some tradable ones. Um, there is the paid relevant salary threshold, uh, which is 26,500 or the going rate for the position, whichever is the higher. Now, if someone doesn't earn that amount of money, but earns at least 20,480 points, um, then they might still qualify. For example, if they have a PhD in a job, in a subject relevant to the job, or in a STEM subject relevant to the job, or if it is a job on the shortage occupation list. Now, what is relevant here in this context for employers who do not have a sponsorship license yet, if they want to employ um, people from the EU, they need to obtain such a sponsorship license. And that will take some time to do so. Um, so our advice there is to apply for this sooner rather than later. Um, if the application is done now, it's still under the old system, but that will be transferred to the new system. 
briefly, intercompany transfer visa. Um, the requirement there are it's got to be the skill level of graduate, graduate level equivalent. Again, there has to be a job offer and it's got to be from a UK licensed sponsor. Um, the salary thresholds are higher um, with regard to that. There is a minimum salary of 41,500. Um, so that is, as I said, is, is, is a higher, a much higher threshold there. The good news, as I mentioned earlier, with regard to that, um, the existing cooling off period, um, which prevented the moment to two um, intercompany transfer migrants from returning to the UK for 12 months after the rule ended in the UK, um, that will be adjusted and that now will allow overseas ICT workers to work in the UK for up to five years in any six year period and up to nine years in any 10 year period if they meet the higher earner salary threshold, with, which is £73,900. Again, what is important to note, there is no possible route to bring low skilled EU national workers into, into the UK, not even on a temporary basis. Um, there are some um, special rules for seasonal agricultural workers, um, but they might come to an end as well. Thank you, Sabila. And I think as a more general point, um, which goes on to other preparation pieces, be very aware where your suppliers or your customers are dependent on people in these categories as to how it's going to affect them, because it may then affect you indirectly. Um, Sabila, I've well, heard of can, I, can I add one more thing, please? please. Um, and I would like to add that in relation to the, the, the question about the resident market labour test, because we had questions um, in that regard. Because that test doesn't apply anymore, um, it's not possible for business to simply say, well, um, you know, we, we, we don't want to jump through all these hoops. It's just far too much hassle um, for us to employ EU nationals um, and therefore we are not going to consider them as possible applicants. Now, that is that would be discriminatory under employment law. Um, there is also case law with regard to that, obviously not with regard to the new rules, but with regard to the current rules. Um, that you can't just say we don't want to take EU nationals or we don't want to look at this applicant um, because we would need to get a sponsorship license. It's too expensive um, and we just um, don't want to do it. So businesses need to be careful there. Thank you, Sabila. And uh, Sabila, we have already a deluge of questions pouring in, most of which are detailed points off the back of what you've already said. So we'll either come back to those at the end of the session or answer them um, in writing following on. So thank you very much for the questions that are coming in. Please do keep them coming in. We will ensure even if there's not time to answer them on the call that we do give you a response on them. Um, moving to Stuart um, and supply trade and tariff. And Stuart, a question which is very dear to my heart because it's been part of what we've been looking at internally for the last two years as our, or 18 months as our working group internally. Uh, is, is what should firms be doing during the implementation transition periods to understand the impact on their supply chains if there's a no deal scenario or if, as we discussed earlier, the, the deal, if it comes through, is goods only? Um, OK, so the key thing for people to do, which is kind of stating the obvious, but it's important, is to understand where supplies are coming from. Are they from the EU or are they elsewhere? Um, and it's useful to identify if there are any other alternative supply routes available. So if you suddenly find there is a problem with whatever your traditional EU source of supply, whether you can then source that source that service or source that goods either within the UK or from elsewhere around the world. Um, once you've done that, check the contract terms upon which that supply is being made um, and check the clauses which could potentially impact on either a move to WTO terms or a move or there being a, a well either a yeah basically check the terms which could apply where there's a no deal scenario WTO terms scenario um, to make sure that you understand which of the two parties to the contract bears that risk is it a risk that sits with you as a customer or is it you as as the supplier we just need to identify that um, Tariff costs are likely to change 
if there's no deal and not only tariffs between the UK and the EU, but also between the UK and the rest of the world, because effectively we piggyback off EU terms as well. It's a good exercise and they're actually published in various places on the Internet to establish what those new tariffs could be. Um, and then practically, I think you need to understand, are you ready to, ready to be able to deal with those? Um, well, are you ready to import in a way that perhaps you haven't before? And I think we've had a question around how do we deal with import declarations? There are people out there, um, freight forwarders and customs agents who, if you've not had a relationship with them in the past, it is worth um, and getting into an arrangement with them now. We have clients out there who are offering that service. Um, and if you haven't done that, it's worth entering into agreement there. Otherwise, you have to access something called CHIEF, which I think it stands for the Customs Handling of Import and Export Freight System. And then you have to acquire a piece of a piece of software to actually access it. So I think actually that the um, simplest solution is go and um, talk to a, a freight forwarder now and get a deal with there. Um, or you can try and do it yourself, but it sounds like a complicated process. Um, and finally, it's kind of all traditional sort of good business interruption planning, which is to make sure that you have sufficient stock in your warehouses or weather to deal with the possible interruptions that may happen sort of January, February, as whatever the new deal is comes in. Stuart, thank you very much. And that, the, the delays at Dover are, are well publicised, but by all accounts, the impact, particularly on fresh goods and perishables, of the delays could be quite material. Uh, as we've all heard in the press about the plan to ban lorries from entering Kent unless they've got a spe special permit to stop Kent clogging up. Um, and as you'll have heard from that, that's one of the reasons why on our own internal working group, Stuart has been a leading light, which has helped us a lot as a firm to make sure that we are as well prepared as we can be so we can keep helping our clients um, going forward. So thank you very much, Stuart. I turn to Brian um, and corporate structures. And Brian, it's one of the things that, um, you know, we've got a lot of work on trade going on uh, generally, but there's also acquisition, mergers and disposal activity going on across borders um, between the UK and the EU and the UK and elsewhere. But also critically, probably some of this has been driven as a consequence of changes corporates are making uh, to respond to Brexit as a strategic play. So, so what, what would you say are the, is the impact of Brexit on, on private M&A transactions that people should be aware of, please? Um, it's, it's interesting, Bruce. We're um, probably one of the most active private M&A um, firms in the UK across all of our different offices. So we're, we're putting together a lot of experience um, from our different fee owners in terms of what's actually happening. Um, and, I, and I think actually whilst the private M&A process itself isn't really changing, what uh, we don't think is happening is, is that the, the process isn't adapting to take into account what is happening on, on the ground with Brexit. Um, as we all know, in, in England we have long forms of contract because we've got this concept of buyer beware. Um, if you don't ask the right question in your contract or seek the right warranty, then you won't have contractual protection. And amazingly, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, sale and purchase agreements in private M&A transactions, just not addressing Brexit. And, um, you know, given given the topics that we're talking about today, M&A tends to cover all of these topics because target companies are the ones that are actually experiencing these things on the ground. Um, amazingly, buyers aren't really adapting their own process to take account of this. So. Uh, from our point of view, I think it's key um, if you're looking to take advantage of the marketplace and there's a lot of M&A activity around at the moment, either taking advantage of um, uh, perhaps weaker rivals in the marketplace. Um, you know, you really must address the Brexit question head on in your purchase agreement. Um, and I'd say that's probably the main the main thing from a from an M&A process angle. Great, thank you, uh, Brian. And we've we had some questions coming in, um, which we'll come back to you later um, uh, from from people in the group or, uh, on the call today already, which is is, is very interesting on that. Um, turning to tax and Sarah, um, VAT, you touched on it earlier. Um, we've had questions from Nikki and from Lawrence um, around similar points um, about VAT treatment of um, a variety of things, uh, particularly in the services space. 
um, and providing sale of digital services and physical services from the UK to uh, Europe and the UK to the rest of the world. So would you be able to address VAT for services and VAT for digital and electronic and um, things like this, a, a webinar if it was being charged for on an international basis? Yes, of course, of course, Bruce. I mean, my main message here is, um, as with everything else, we don't know what the precise impact is going to be. So it's very much business as usual, as much as it can be in the current circumstances. Um, so um, thank you very much for these questions regarding supply of services. Um, and I agree with you um, that nothing really has changed as far as we're aware. So um, it's the current place of supply rules apply. Um, and those determine which country you need to charge um, an account for VAT in. And they will continue to apply largely in the same way as they do now. Um, one of the main changes that I would point out though for the supply of services uh, is in relation to digital services specifically. Um, as the UK's mini one-stop shop portal, as it's called, or the MOS system, which is uh, used to report and pay VAT on the sales of digital services to consumers in the EU, will no longer um, be used. So if a business wants to carry on using the MOS system, they're going to need to register for the VAT MOS non-union scheme um, in an EU member state. Um, so therefore, that's another layer of administration that really businesses need to get onto now. Um, digital services for VAT purposes don't include live webinars like this, but they can include online courses consisting of pre-recorded um, videos and downloadable documents and PDFs, for example. Um, so if any services offered that you offer as a business are classed as digital services, um, because they are an online course, for example, this change, um, this change um, to the one stop shop portal is something that you're going to need to be aware of as a business. So again, my message is um, really review what your business provides, where they provide um, that supply of goods or services and really make sure um, that you have all your um, eggs in your basket and all your ducks in a row um, for when we leave the EU. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, Sarah. And it's an interesting thought, isn't it, that if we were charging for this this webinar, that doing it live now, we wouldn't have to pay VAT. But if you listen to it later, you might have to. Uh, it's yeah. a very complicated world. Uh, there's got to be a joke about the moss growing on something there as well, but we'll leave that one. Uh, so the moss system is very important. Um, so turning to regulatory and, and Craig. Um, so Craig, looking at two, two sides of the lens, uh, We've had a question, what, if, if anything, do firms regulated by FCA have to tell their customers about Brexit? And then the second side of it, if you are a customer of an FCA regulated entity in terms of investment in advisors or other things, what should you be expecting them to tell you? And are there major things you're likely to need to do or think about that in response? Great, thank you. Um, so starting with FCA entities, um, it, it's clear from the FCA rules that there is a, an expectation under Principle 7 and Principle 6 that you treat your customers fairly and that you are providing and communicating with them in a way that's clear, fair and not misleading. Um, but beyond that, the FCA has made it very clear in Brexit related um, guidance that the starting point is to undertake a risk mapping exercise as to how Brexit is likely to impact your customers. And that will vary depending on where your customers are located in the services provided. Following that risk mapping exercise, FCA uh, regulated entities are expected to contact their customers before the end of the uh, transition period, uh, making it clear um, as to how they may be affected by various different scenarios. Um, you must communicate with your customers in good time, usually the earlier the better. You must communicate clearly to your customers, taking care to avoid confusion with multiple messages uh, which could change over time. Um, in addition to focused, targeted communication with individuals and in, in your particular customer base, um, the FCA has made it clear that there should be general guidance as to how customers might be affected published on websites or on marketing material that's sent out generally about the services that you are providing on a continuing basis. Um, looking at the other side of that coin um, from a customer perspective, um, you should, if you have not already, hear from any um, FCA regulated suppliers by the end of the transition period. 
And the things that they're going to be um, telling you about or should be telling you about are things like access to compensation schemes um, and how they may be affected by Brexit scenarios, whether you can continue to access them and how you access them. Um, uh, th things like your client money, if you have money deposited with uh, financial institutions, how that is safeguarded um, in various Brexit scenarios. Um, and also the applicability or otherwise of existing contracts from a, from a Brexit uh, perspective. The other angle that's relevant here is if you are a supplier to an FCA regulated firm, you are likely to be, if you're not already, approached um, in the course of a due diligence exercise because the FCA company, FCA regulated entity, will need to understand for its own purposes the impact that Brexit is having on its suppliers so that it can factor in any risks that are associated, for example, with break clauses in contracts or the applicability of enforcement at the supplier end. So there are a number of touch points that you may come in contact with FCA regulated entities because of either the communication they have to do with customers or the due diligence exercise they're doing with their suppliers. Craig, thank you very much. And it's worth saying on that last point that that's um, uh, something that we as a supplier to FCA regulated entities of legal services have also uh, been encountering over recent months. So it is definitely happening and definitely worth being prepared for because if there's a last minute scramble, um, you know, as a supplier, you need to make sure you're able to, to answer those questions effectively. Thank you very much. So we'll then move on to Cheryl Palmer Hughes. And uh, Cheryl, there's, um, I've got two two questions that have come, come in specifically um, to in, for, for you on uh, at the start. And thank you. We have a, a lot of questions coming in at the moment, so we may not be able to get to all of them uh, within the call. But as I say, we will note them all up and follow them on all up afterwards in writing. Um, so Cheryl, we had a question from Craig. Um, which is what are the implications for healthcare post Brexit? And uh, as a follow on point to that, if you're a victim of an accident abroad in the event of an ODL Brexit or a, a deal which doesn't cover that aspect, uh, what, what will happen to you? So implications of healthcare post Brexit and what happens in an accident? Would you, would you be able to pick those up, please? Of course, thank you. Um, and the two actually go quite nicely hand in hand. Um, obviously, we have the benefit of the EHIC system. Um, in the EU currently, but my, my advice generally um, is that travel, travel insurance will often cover more than just immediate emergent health care um, when you are abroad. Um, and so this would apply worldwide as well. Um, and I think adopting that um, mantra beyond Brexit, it, it is unlikely unless you fall into a specific category of um, excluded people that um, the EU regime will fall away and that you will need um, separate insurance to cover you for your medical needs unless in the absence of any deal or agreement um, that is akin to the regime that we currently have um, unless the UK enters into specific agreements with specific countries in which case it will change country to country as to what you might be entitled to if you do find yourself a um, victim of an accident or even ill abroad um, so I think the safety, safest position is um, to look at travel insurance, look at the terms and conditions of it. Um, and I, as I say, I would recommend that anyway, because that often will provide cover um, for your out-of-pocket expenses. You know, for family members in the hospital, you need to be traveling there, if you need to stay out there for longer. Um, so I think it's very important that you think of um, covering yourself beyond the actual immediate healthcare um, and looking at insurance that will provide um, for other expenses too. And the reason that I say that this sometimes goes hand in hand with what happens if you are injured abroad, um, we sometimes do get calls from people who are in the acute phase of their treatment in hospitals and families are struggling to either um, bring people back home or to cover the costs that have been incurred in a foreign country. Um, and so as a very practical point, before we even get to the legal issues, that existence of cover for the um, treatment needs, the travel costs, um, it's very important that it's covered by travel insurance. Once we're beyond that, so if somebody's injured abroad within the EU territory, um, beyond Brexit, um, then we will, and we always have done, weighed up what the options are because there is often a choice of where a person could bring a claim. Um, the current European regulations often allow English citizens who are injured in, in the EU to bring a claim in the, in the courts in England. Um, those will fall away automatically if we don't have a deal or um, if we don't sign up to specific conventions. Um, and so it might be that we revert back to the default position, which generally speaking is that you bring the claim in the country either where the defendant is 
for where you have sustained you, the accident um, occurred. So often the default position will be that you might have to bring a claim in a foreign country. Um, and I mentioned that in the context of travel insurance because travel insurance sometimes will provide cover for legal fees. Um, in most countries across across the globe, say for England um, and the United States, people are expected to pay for their legal costs up front and privately without any scope of recovering from a defendant. So it's a very important practical consideration um, to make sure that you might have cover for that. That said, um, there will be ways of arguing that a, 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 a UK person who is injured in any um, foreign country might be able to bring their claim in England and Wales, um, but that will be quite fact specific. It will be dependent on the accident type, the injury type, and we'll have to look carefully at our own private international law rules, which will, be, which will become more important for EU claims. And they are already there across the globe for people who are injured outside of the EU, and we'll have to call on them again um, for people who are injured in the EU in the event of no deal and no equivalent regime. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, it's quite a sobering thought and um, the reality that came home to me because many years back I had a, a road accident in Switzerland and uh, was met as I got out of the ambulance into the A&E corridor at the hospital in Switzerland with a requirement to pay cash before they'd let me into the um, uh, into the A&E unit. Um, so scrambling around for, for Swiss francs was uh, not quite what I'd expected having uh, been salvaged off the road from uh, someone else causing a crash. So really important to focus on. I'm very conscious, I'm very grateful we've got a lot of questions that have come in. Um, some of them are quite specific and may have a particular focus for one or two people on the call. So I'm going to see if I can focus uh, on uh, a couple of the ones which may have wider application to a number of people on the call. That's not to say we won't come back on the more specific ones, we will do, but we'll do that separately after the, the call today. Um, there's a question, uh, Brian, uh, which has come in uh, for you, and I believe it's from uh, one of our, our current clients, and thank you for that, uh, which is um, around company structure. If there's an EU company with a branch in the UK, which is currently looking at the company structure anyway, uh, which I guess a lot of companies are at the moment, uh, what points should they consider? Brian, would you be able to give us a brief view on that, please? Yeah, sure, Bruce. I think. Um so let's put this in context. I think most um, most companies who do trade in the UK or, or, or set up an establishment here would normally incorporate as a, as a as a private limited company in the UK, and that would be a subsidiary of the um, of the overseas entity. Um, I think that is an option that, that can be considered. So the branch um, structure could be turned into a a, a corporate entity, so a limited liability corporate entity to become part of the, the, the proper group, if you like, um, a, a separate member of that group. Of course, there are reasons why some companies do set up as branches. Um, those are often for uh, tax, often tax reasons, for instance. And I think any sort of change to the corporate structure would need to be sort of taken in the round. I think risks would need to be weighed up in terms of the, um, the benefits of remaining as a branch, but with this big risk um, sitting over you or simply incorporating into a, a, a company. And I, this goes the other way around. I think a, a UK parent company having a branch overseas may want to incorporate that branch overseas just to give a bit, a bit of certainty. Um, I think this particular question seems to suggest that um, there is a degree of restructuring being considered already. So I think that incorporation point is probably one that should be borne in mind. Thank you, Brian. A related question for Sarah, please, on tax, which um, would often tie in with this, which is what's the impact of Brexit on drafting tax documents for buying and selling companies, uh, which is something you might see within a group restructuring, for example, and also related to that, how would Brexit affect loan agreements that are in place from a tax perspective, if you're able to touch on both of those briefly, please? Yes, thank you, Bruce. I have the pleasure of working with Brian um, on M&A deals across the firm. Um, so, as probably some of you are aware, when you buy or sell a company, you have a tax set of tax warranties and a, and a tax covenant to protect you, the buyer, against um, unexpected tax liabilities. Now, that's not going to fundamentally change, um, but the key thing, that message that I get over to you is, as Brian said earlier, Brexit is often not con considered at all when drafting um, these documents, and we need to make sure that any change of law risk 
is specifically um, considered in your documents in relation to Brexit. Um, I could go into um, a lot of detail around that, but I won't. And I'm very happy to follow up with anyone after this call. Um, but the tax covenant very rarely refers to VAT specifically. Um, so you would make sure your documents refer to a wide definition of tax so that it captures everything and that could possibly be tax both post um, and pre Brexit. Um, if I could turn now to um, loan agreements, um, again, Brexit has no effect specifically um, on a loan agreement, but that is provided that your agreement is a, in a loan market association, an LMA standard form. Um, the indemnity clauses and the grossing up clauses that you'd find um, in a loan agreement are based usually on UK domestic and international treaty law, not EU law. So Brexit shouldn't have any effect on those um, and it also shouldn't have any effect on the other tax clauses such as stamp taxes clauses. Um, but as I said, it's very important to check that your loan agreements are in a loan market association standard format. Um, because if they are not, um, then there's a possibility um, that VAT and whatever format it's in after Brexit isn't included in your tax indemnity clauses. Um, and also your construction of law clauses in your agreements um, may not be right. So, um, as I said earlier in relation to contracts, a very good time now just to check through all the loan agreements and check they will be Brexit ready for the new year. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, Sarah. And so before I turn to Sibylla with a couple of questions we've had, which are again connected in many ways, can I briefly ask Stuart, um, just looking at this from the point of view of intra-group contracting, particularly around cross-border aspects, I guess, with what we're doing, are there any um, key terms or, uh, that should be reviewed within existing intra-group or supply chain cross-border contracts that you'd want people to focus on? I think probably the biggest one well, one of the biggest ones to consider is actually data protection. And I know in a couple of weeks, is it the 18th of November? We're, we're doing a we're doing a data protection special, but certainly um, organisations have been quite used to sharing data um, internally within the group across border. And I think that's one of the key things you need to look at and make sure you've got the right um, documentation in place to allow you to continue to do so. Right, thank you very much. And Sabina, we had a, a lot of questions on employment. I'm just going to pick a couple which connect with the theme we've been talking through. The first one, and if I can ask them both and ask you to answer them both briefly, is if a worker is moved from one company to another, uh, with presumably within a group, um, after they've been granted a visa, uh, will that visa persist and how long will it last for? And then second related question, do you have to have a sponsorship license for pre-settled employees? Thank you, Bruce. Um, let me start with the last question about um, pre-settled employees. The answer to that um, is no. If you have an employee who has pre-settled status, they will not fall um, under the new immigration rules, which is why we're talking a lot to clients at the moment um, to suggest to them that if they can bring people over, um, before the end of this year so that they would fall under the settlement scheme rather than the new rules, um, then that should be done. Um, as far as the other question is concerned about the um, companies, I, I'm assuming is, I, I'm not sure whether that is one company outside the UK and um, one company within the UK under the skilled workers visa, a new visa application is required when employers are changed um, or when jobs are changed so that there's a new SOC code. Um, if there is a inter intra company transfer visa and then they will want to switch between or to another intra company in the UK, then I still think that needs to be, that can't just be done freely without um, any notification or any changes. Um, so I'm, I think I'm happy to speak to whoever asked the question afterwards to get some more facts about where, where these two companies are that the question related to. 
Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Craig one last question briefly before I then ask everyone for some closing thoughts as we're running up to time now. Um, so Craig, um, very conscious that quite a lot of firms will have money or assets, either their own or sometimes those of their clients um, uh, held or deposited in institutions outside of their home country, either within the EEA or EU. Um, do you have any advice uh, for people on the call as to what they should think about if they have um, money or deposits, either their own or clients' ones um, outside of their own territory at the moment? Uh, to, to put it very simply, Bruce, if you've not heard from your supplier who has uh, that money on deposit or, or, or controls that money for you, get in contact with them uh, and ask them what their um, contingency planning is, uh, is around Brexit and, and how they are safeguarding that money for you. Of course, if you're not satisfied with the answer, you may want to consider spreading your risk and consider depositing it in a UK institution with the protection come with that EU with the UK protection um, but there there may be tax implications of, of, of bringing that money into those institutions I'm sure Sarah could uh, help you in that regard if you wanted to ask questions of, of that nature um, but the other thing that you could do is, is check um, your insurance position from a business interruption perspective to, to consider whether um, that scenario of access and safeguarding to, to your money um, in a Brexit scenario is covered by your business disruption insurance. Brilliant, thank you. Now, as we're running close to time, I'm just going to ask each one, each person in turn, starting first with Cheryl, who still terrified me of memories of my motor accident in Switzerland all those years ago, um, to, uh, to, to, to lead off with, please, your key takeaway. If there's one thing that people should take away today and act on, um, in respect of uh, the personal injury space and the areas you've touched on today, what would it be? Sure, no, at the risk of um, striking fear into everyone, I think the most important takeaway is time limits. We've been very focused on a Brexit time limit, um, but there are countries out there where you've got very short limitation periods as well. Um, and I think, generally speaking, people can't afford to wait to seek advice and um, despite the pandemic I think a lot of people might have been dealing with the priorities completely understandably um, but I think people have got to turn an eye to time limits and making sure um, that they are presenting themselves in the event of Brexit or some foreign law applying to the time limit within which they can bring a claim. Right thank you and Craig same question. Yeah so if, if you're an FCA regulated firm it's undertaking that risk mapping exercise as to how the various Brexit scenarios may affect both your business and your customers and communicating that to your customers. If you're a customer, then asking the question of your supplier to say, what are you doing about the various scenarios so that you can take comfort and, and ensure that it's not going to interrupt your business. Super, thank you. And Sarah? Everybody. Um, my key takeaway here is review all your contracts now, who you do business and where you do business. Look at your taxes clauses um, and take advice where you need to. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. And Brian. Yeah, review, review your group structures. Um, if you're doing a transaction, really consider Brexit due diligence and contractual protection. Thank you very much. And Stuart, um, could I have your thoughts, please? Under, well, know and understand your supply chain, understand the terms on which it operates and make sure you do your research and understand the tariffs that are likely to be payable as from 1st of January. Thank you and I've just realised on the GDPR theme that you have a safe harbour behind you which used to be applicable to you. <laughs> Sorry. Steve. That's a poor uh, Yeah, uh, And Sevilla please. Um, look at your workforce now, but also look at the workforce that you are likely to have next year um, and the years after and apply for a sponsorship license sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. And we had a question generally raised by a couple of people, in fact two of them were university students, about what our firm is doing. And the short answer is that for the last 18 months, two years, we've been working actively to prepare ourselves internally so that we're as ready as we can be for whatever happens using the advice and support of our own colleagues on the call today. And also we've been building and preparing a prioritised list of um, advice and guidance and support of which this uh, webinar is part of the series to help our clients 
focusing very much on the things you need to do as top priorities and helping to provide as much certainty and clarity as possible. So in the final minute of the call, I'd just like to remind you that all of the speakers today, their email addresses are on uh, the uh, flyer for the conversation today and on the Brexit Hub. The Brexit Hub has all of the details of the speakers and other content has been updated regularly. We will be providing a summary of the key questions and answers in the call and are happy to do a Brexit follow up, a brief conversation to help scope your key issues and help you to think, you to think about how to plan those going forwards. Our next webinar in the series is on GDPR and Brexit. Are you prepared? 18th of November 2020 from 10 to 11 o'clock. Please do subscribe and please do tune in and please do tell other people who, might, who, you, may think, who you think may find it helpful. And finally, on the um, Q&A box on the uh, Brexit Hub, please do give us some feedback about this session and future sessions and please do submit questions. We want to make these as good and as useful for you as they can be. So please help us to help you by giving us feedback on what's good, what's missing and what could be better. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone for your time today and we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Goodbye.